Matt Evans was one shot away from claiming victory in the 2004 Olympics. And he was competing in the 50 meter three position rifle event. Now, what's interesting is he was so good, he did not even have to hit the bullseye to win. All he had to do was hit the target, and if he hit the target, he was guaranteed a gold, right? That's all he had to do. And normally, so he fires, and normally the shot that he made would receive a score of 8.1, would have been more than enough to give him the gold medal. But what is described as an extremely rare mistake in elite competition, Eamons fired at the wrong target. Standing in lane two, he fired at the target in lane three. Now, do you know what kind of score you get when you, when you have a really good shot but still hit the wrong target? You know what your score is? It's zero. And instead of winning the gold medal, which he so easily should have done, he ended up in eighth place. And when I think about that, I, I think about um, us. I think, I, I want to speak to the church today, but especially you graduating seniors, I want to speak to you. I want you to, what I'm going to say today applies to every single one of us. But I really want to challenge you this morning to do this. I want to make sure that you guys, that all of us, but especially you seniors as you're headed out, that you stay centered on what matters most. And it is so easy for us to get distracted. Um, matter of fact, let me, let me say this. There's going to be a lot of well-intentioned people who come to you. And, and again, this applies to the rest of us too. There's well-intentioned people that come to us and say, hey, listen, you know, follow your dreams. Shoot for the stars. Do what makes you happy. Right? All these whatever other cliches you want to throw in there that they say. And listen, I don't want to be a dream crusher this morning. That's the last thing I want to do. I don't want to say those same things. But I do want to just say this real quick. All right? If your dreams or even your parents' dreams or your friends' and family's dreams don't line up with God's dreams, then I want to remind you what matters most is staying focused on Him. It's staying constantly in His lane. Are you with me? Again, I'm not against dreams, and I'm not against uh, that, but uh, against people saying, hey, do what makes you happy. But, well, I just want to say this. What matters most in life is following Jesus. I mean, we know that in theory, but I mean, I want us to really get that. All right? I want to make sure that we're firing at the target of the lane that we're standing in. All right? and, and as we walk through life, both as adults, we can tell you this, and young people, you already know it too, but you are gonna, there are so many things that are going to vie for your attention. There are so many things that are going to distract us. There are going to be so many things that well, you, you may be, man, I'm right here. I mean, Abby's answer is Jesus, 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 right? And that, our, that's our answer. But you know what? Lanes, and you're, in lane, you're in lane three, and that's where Jesus is, but lanes one, two, and then you know, you know, five and six, whatever. There's all these things that catch our eyes and catch our attention and distract us. And it is so easy to get off a target. That's what Satan does. He loves to do it. He loves to get us off of target. And so I just want to challenge you this morning that as, as those, you're hearing those voices, as they're fighting for your attention, it's so easy to get off sight. And, and I'll just say this. You know what? Typically, you're going to hit what you aim for, right? You're going to hit what you're aiming for. I want to challenge all of us this morning, no matter what, a, what stage of life we're in, to make sure that we're in the right lane, to make sure that Jesus is our target and we are focused on him, no matter what the world throws at us. Now, let me just give us a word of caution real quick before we do that, all right? Because I, I've said this before, this is nothing new around here, but following Jesus is not necessarily easy. Matter of fact, I would say it's anything but easy. Those of you who have been a Christ follower for a while, you know what I'm talking about. Following Jesus is not, hey, let me say a prayer, and then let me just have this casual commitment to following Jesus. Matter of fact, Jesus says it's going to radically transform your life. As a matter of fact, when you become a follower of Christ, it may just wreck all of your plans. It may just change who you are. Matter of fact, Jesus said this. Turn with me real quick to Luke 9.23. It's not a new verse. If you've been to NBC for any amount of time, you've heard us preach this verse before and say this verse. But I want to remind you one more time, the words of Jesus. Jesus turns around to a crowd. The crowd's been following because crowds always follow. It's, it's, it's cool to follow Jesus. 
I mean, Jesus does cool things. He heals people. He feeds people, right? He brings people from the dead. That's a pretty cool thing. But when Jesus says, um, that's great that you want those things, but I also want you to follow me, let me clarify, Jesus says real quick, what I mean by follow, all right? Young people, this is what it means when, he, when I say stay in your lane. This is what Jesus would say to us. And he says in Luke 9, 23, Then he said to the crowd, If anyone wants to be my follower, if you want to stay in my lane, if you want to hit the target, here's what you've got to do. You've got to turn from your selfish ways. You've got to quit living for you. And you've got to take up your cross and follow me. Now that is a radically different thought than what the world tells you. And like I said, there's going to be a lot of great people who say both to you graduating seniors and to us as adults, do it, you know, just go for it, shoot for the stars, man, all that stuff. And that's awesome. I, I, I'm for that as long as it's within the target of what Jesus calls you to do with your life, right? This is not a verse um, that's, that is a well, a wealth, health, and prosperity gospel. I don't see that in there. This is not a verse um, that it, it says, man, it's all about me. This is a verse that says, die, die, die to yourself. This is a verse that Jesus says, listen, you've got to quit thinking about you. You've got to quit thinking about your lane, and you've got to literally die to yourself. Jesus says, take up your cross. As we've said it before, a cross is what? It's an instrument of death, of torture. It's more than something that we put on the back of our car or wear in a t-shirt or wear around our necks. It's, it's more than that, guys. Jesus says, listen, young people, middle-aged people, old people, older, respected senior citizens, all right? No offense, no offense, Dad. Right? <laughs> Jesus says, I don't care what age you are. If you want to follow me, it can't be about you. Are you with me? Jesus says, if you want to follow me, it can't be about you. And I know I'm probably preaching a message this morning that, that's counterintuitive to what you're hearing. I, I mean, I've been to already two graduations, going to a third one, and, and I heard every one of them say at some point, you know, you're going to go from here and you've got dreams and plans to follow your dreams. Some way they said in some sentence, follow your dreams. And I'm saying, follow Jesus' dreams. I want to challenge every one of us in this room on that this morning. So how do we do that? How do we stay in our lane? How do we stay focused? I want to talk for just a few minutes, if I can, on what matters most in life, all right? On what matters most is staying centered. I want to give you four things that I hope, again, I, I, I am, yes, I'm kind of speaking to the graduating seniors, but there is not a single person that can hear my voice that this doesn't apply to. Are you with me? So don't tune out because we're honoring seniors this morning. I need this. You need this. Here's the first thing. If you get your outlines, pull those out because we like to fill in the blanks around here. If you don't want to do that, that's cool. You can just follow along. I'm going to give you four things that need to happen, all right, um, in order to stay focused, to stay in your lane. Here's the first thing, all right? Here's what I want you to say. I, or I want you to write down. Live always, always live for others. Write that down. Always live for others. Now, I, I've said, if you've spent any time with me at all or, or, or just been around me at all, I, I know I, I become redundant sometimes. We're creatures of habit. We do that. And I say this constantly. And I'm going to say it again. The thing that matters most in your life are relationships. There is nothing that is more important than relationships. Why? Because all of life is centered around relationships. Every single one of us is in some kind of relationship. It may be a good relationship, it may be a bad relationship, but we are in relationships. And so what matters most is how we treat other people. All right. And so here's what I want us to do this morning. Let me just spend a few minutes on this. Here's what I want to challenge you to do. I think the most important thing, and young people listen to me, and adults listen to me, the most important thing we can do as human beings, is to add value to other people's lives. Are you, are you with me? The most important thing that you and I can do is to add value to somebody's lives. I want to challenge you this morning, no matter where you go, no matter who you're dealing with, to add value to their lives. Now listen, there's people who prefer things like power and money and, and, you know, and fortune and fame, and you know what? They are never, ever filled up. They'll tell you that, and it feels good in the moment. They're filled up, or, or th th maybe in that moment, but they always find themselves empty. And here's the other thing that happens. When that is what your focus is, when that's what your target, target is, guess what? You 
leave behind a wake of, of hurt and pain and broken relationships in your life, if that's your number one goal. What if, graduating seniors, what if, church, you and I, we made it our goal to say, I, I'm going to adopt the mindset that says, I'm going to add value in, to, to whatever relationship I'm in, even if I don't like the relationship, even if it's a difficult relationship. So let me, let me, let me give you a couple thoughts here. I think they're not in your outline, but I'll throw them up on the screen as well. I tell you what, before I do that, though, let's look at, here, here's, and not only that, you're doing what God wants you to do. Philippians 2.4 says this. Paul said this, don't look out only for your own interest, but take an interest in others too. Now that's contrary to our culture, isn't it? It just is, because culture says it's all about us. This goes along with what Jesus said, die to yourself, take up your cross, and follow me. All right? So here's what I want you to do. I, I, let's adopt this mindset. Actually, uh, Dr. Rick Upchurch, who used to attend with us, he, he sent me some of this stuff about um, uh, adding value to people, and I've kind of adapted. I've used some of his, and I've added some of my own. But let me just give you a couple of them real quick. Here's the first one. If you're married today, or young people, one day you will be married. And I know that's, that's a goal for many of you. Um, and again, let's not, you don't have to be in a hurry for that, all right? Uh, especially parents are saying that, all right? But if you're going to be married or you are married, add value to your marriage by putting your spouse ahead of yourself. Think through that. Now, I, I know that I fail at this one quite often, but the times that I do it and I do it well, it only enhances our marriage. And anybody who's in a relationship with us, with, with, that is married, you understand what I'm talking about. It makes your spouse want to serve you, and it makes you want to serve them. And so, young people, I would say as you begin that mindset of one day having a spouse, make sure you already have adopted that mindset that says, hey, I want to add value to you. I'm not marrying you so I can get something out of it. I want to marry so I can give something to it. Does that make sense? And for those of us in this room that are already married, add value to your marriage. All right, here's the second thing. All right. Add value to your children's lives by intentionally being a part of their lives. Add value to your children's lives as uh, you intentionally add value to their lives. It was one year ago today, or not today, one year ago, this, this time period, that we were doing this for my oldest son, Christian. And now my stepson, Joshua, is graduating. And we've got three more that are going to be here before we know it, Right? And, um, and, and I, say to, you know, I say to you parents today that have kids, and I say to you teenagers one day when you have kids, again, let's you know, take your time on that, all right? Get married first and then have kids, all that good stuff. Um, but can I just tell you, as a 43-year-old man now, and I'm watching, man, life is just going by fast. I mean, I can't believe that... Um, you know, I have a son who's, who's in college, and now a stepson who's about to go to college, and a th my third son who is going to be a junior in high school, and then two more that are not far behind them. Can I just tell you how quickly it passes? And if young people, especially right now, you can get this, that I can begin to get the mindset that when one day God gives me these incredible gifts called kids, that you invest in them. And you invest by spending time with them. Matter of fact, embrace Deuteronomy 6. It says this. Deuteronomy 6 says, <clears throat> verses 5 and 7, You must love the Lord your God with all of your heart, and all your soul, and all your strength. And you must commit yourselves wholeheartedly to these commands that I'm giving you today. Stop right there. Now look, right there, right there the author is speaking to you. He's saying you as parents, us as adults, this is what he's saying. You've got, first and foremost, this is the greatest commandment, right? This is what the guy came and asked Jesus, what do I do? And Jesus said, love the Lord your God with all your whole heart, soul, mind, and strength. And then he added the other one, love others, right? And so that's the first part. Parents, you cannot do, what I have highlighted there, or bolded and underlined, you cannot do until you get this one down. Because if you are not in love with God, you will never convey that to your children. If you are not committed to these commandments, you can't teach them to your kids. But the author says, Moses says here, look, repeat them again and again to your children. Talk about them when you're home and when you're on the road and when you're going to bed and when you're getting up. The point is, no matter what you're doing, parents, listen to me, every moment is a teaching moment. 
Every moment is a moment for you to add value to your kids' lives. Trust me, there is a culture around us who's teaching them something. They're on social media more than we are. And they're being bombarded with things. And I just say to us who are parents and those who are going to be one day, make that a priority. Add value to your children by being involved in their lives. Amen? Amen. All right, third thing, just with with this. Um, You know what? Add value to your work by being fully engaged in your job. And again, I'm talking to those who, uh, regular uh, adults right now who have jobs, and I'm talking to you young people that have jobs one day. But to you young people, real quick, you know what? Your generation has been labeled the lazy generation. It has. That, That you have this idea of entitlement and that you're lazy, and be quite honest with you, some of that is right. We see it. Others... I don't see it because Michael just talked about how you guys are servants. We see you serve. But I just want to say this. One day when you, and and I say this to those of you right now, maybe you're in a dead-end job that you don't like. Find a way to be fully engaged. Don't just show up at your job saying, okay, this is my paycheck, and I just got to get through the day, and I'm going to try to get away with as little as possible while I'm in the job. You know what I challenge you to do? Young people, you know what I challenge you to do? Be leaders at your job. Be, whether whether you're, it's with your peers, your coworkers, whether it's maybe one day you're a boss and you have employees, or even to your boss, I want to challenge you, add value to your job. Think about it. A lot of us work in very depressing workplaces. What if you're the one who goes in and you bring value to that? What if you're the one who goes in and says, you know what, because I'm staying on target, because Christ is the center of my life, I'm going to let that light shine, baby. And I'm going to let it shine even in my job. Don't be a part of this culture that says I'm entitled and I'm lazy. I say embrace your job and be fully engaged in it. Second thing is this, or, or fourth thing, whatever number I'm on, I don't know. Next bullet point says add value to your community by remembering you didn't get where you are on your own. You didn't. I mean, it takes numerous people to help you get where you are. Your parents, first and foremost. Then you have a church. You have an awesome youth pastor like Michael. Or others of you, you know, you've had friends and family members who've helped you get involved. So you know what I say? Give back to your community. Be one of, be a, I mean, this is totally biblical, guys. You don't just, you know, graduate from high school and then go have a family and get a job and you just stay recluse, you know, like, like recluse in your home. And then you go out, get involved in things like my father's house across the street. Find a Bible-believing in church and get involved, plugged into that church and stay there and serve. Does that make sense? Your community helped get where you are. Add value back to your community. Guys, add value to your friendships. Every one of us this applies to. Add values to your friendships. Don't be in a relationship only for what you can get out of it. Every relationship that we're in, what can I give? What can I add to this relationship? Am I someone that people can come to and they can lean on and they can trust? And then finally, I would say add value to your soul by deepening your relationship with Jesus Christ. This is without a doubt the most important thing you'll ever do, and we're going to come back to that in just a minute. Actually, point number four is the most important one. I'm not necessarily going over these in order of importance. Um, We're going to come to that. So just to summarize what I just said, all right, if you put others first by adding value to their lives, you're going to uncover one of the great mysteries of life. And you know what that is? When you invest in others, It always comes back to you. It does. And I don't don't mean, I'm not talking monetarily. I'm talking about relationally. If you are one who invests in other people, when you need people, they'll be there for you. And let me tell you something. We all need people in our lives. Godly people that we can trust. All right? All right, here's the second. So that's the first thing I would say to you is, 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 is live your life for others. Because your life is not your own. It's not about you. Live for others by adding value. Here's the second thing I would say to you. Write this down. Don't give up when things get difficult. Don't be quitters. Don't give up. Um, 
Listen, I, I, we, just, we have a problem in our culture, in our society, where we don't value commitment. We see it in marriages all the time. We just we don't commit to things. Actually, I want you to know, though, I did a little research. As I, was, I was very encouraged. And I found several different places um, where they're saying that the divorce rate is, is actually not at 50% anymore. It's, it's coming down. That, that we're seeing in the 60s and 70s, everybody was getting divorced, and that trend has carried on. But now in the, in, the, in the 2000s, it's starting to go back up. People are staying together. It used to be 15 years, it never happened. And, and so I would just say that's just, But there just seems to be this motto in life that just seems, well, if it's difficult, if it's hard, then um, I'm just going to quit and go on to something else. And I want to challenge us this morning. I'll tell you what, maybe you don't know this. And so let me be the one to enlighten you if you don't know this, all right? I'm just, just speaking to all of us. Bad things happen to good people. Guess what? Bad things happen. Matter of fact, Jesus said this. Look what he said in Matthew 5, 45. For he gives sunlight to both the evil and the good, and he sends rain on the just and the unjust alike. In other words, it doesn't matter who you are, it doesn't matter how good you are, how much you love Jesus, guess what? There's going to be bad things that happen to you. That's what's going to happen. Bad things will almost certainly come your way if they haven't already. And people who don't give up when difficult things happen, you know what those are? A good, a good word for them is they're resilient. You know what it means to be resilient? Resilient means I can, it means I can bounce back, I can get through this. Resilient people refuse to let bad things that have happened or that are happening define them as a person. Are you with me? I'm not going to I'm not going to be a victim of my circumstance. So I say to you develop a resilient spirit. Let me tell you what young people especially I mean adults we need this too, right? We got to have this. But I'm just telling you life is hard. And I don't want to sugarcoat something and say follow Jesus and you'll be happy. No, follow Jesus and you're going to face persecution, you're going to face hardship. So what do you do through that? You bounce back. You persevere through it, all right? The only difference, guys, you may, want to, you may want to listen to this. The only difference between failure and success is the determination to let go of the past and just simply say, I'm going to try it again. I'm going to do it again. Here are a couple thoughts on resiliency, all right? Again, I think these will be on the screen. They're not in your outline, but resiliency, let me remind you, is the ability to bounce back. It's the key to successful life. This means resilient people are able to monitor and regulate their own emotions, right? Look, we are emotional beings, are we not? I mean, it's, isn't it amazing yeah, how, you know, we can be happy one minute and just excited, and a few hours later, especially if you have teenagers or preteens, you know what I'm talking about, you know, it's just like, dude, just a minute ago, she was as happy as can be, and now who is this demon in my house? Anyway, all right, but you know what? Resilient people realize that our emotions are just simply a part of life part of who we are. Do we, do we not have those bullet points? Okay, I don't, all right. Um, but we're able to monitor and regulate our emotions. We're, we're emotional beings. We get that. And so I'm just, I'm angry right now, but I'm, I'm going to step back. I'm going to process before I lash out. Second thing is this, um, is that resilient people, you know what, they stay focused on solving the problem. They, they don't, they don't, their mind doesn't drift away from the problem, or guess what? We don't ignore the problem. If there's a problem and you ignore it, the problem's going to get bigger. <laughs> so resilient people say, okay, i got to hit this problem head on with Jesus, and we're going to get through this. Uh, resilient people accurately distinguish between what they have control over and what they do not control. You realize, okay, I have nothing I can do about that but I'm going to persevere. They have persevere. They have strong connections to others and rely on those connections to help them through tough times. I've already talked about that with relationships. You know what resilient people do? People who don't give up, they see challenges as opportunities. And resilient people refuse to consider themselves a victim. And finally, I just want to say this, resilient people refuse to be defeated. Here's what I love, guys, about people who are resilient is that in every adversity, in every challenge, resilient people who trust in God, you know what? They always find hope in every situation. Did you hear me? Hope. Young people, l listen to me for just a minute, okay? There are several of us adults who've lost hope. There are several adults who we've just given up. Can I just tell you, as long as you have hope, what else do you need? 
Don't give up. And as long as you have Jesus, you have hope. And, and let me just say one other thing real quick, all right, and then I'm, I'm going to move on. But people, and, and this goes for all of us in this room, everyone in this room, people that we love, people that we count on, guess what people do? They hurt us. They betray us. They let us down. Um, they stab us in the back, right? And we're going to find that happens in life. There is not a single person in this room who is not without a character flaw, right? There's not a single person in this room who doesn't have a fault. You know what resilient people do? They say, I'm going to see past that. And I'm going to trust that Jesus is going to work this out. I just want to challenge young people and adults, all of us. Let's not be quitters. Let's be committed to what God, God has called us to. And if we're in lane number three, we're going to stay in lane number three no matter what. Does that make sense? All right. Um, matter of fact, I had a couple other verses here. This is, this is what's cool. Um, don't give up when things get difficult or people hurt you, but rather, you know what, embrace them, forgive them. I love, most of us in this room knows what Romans 8.28 says. It says this, And we know that God causes everything to work together for good for those who love God and are called according to His purpose for them. Or, I like uh, what Joseph said here. Uh, remember when Joseph's brothers um, had um, sold him into slavery? In Genesis, and, and finally, you know, they, there's this, I don't have time to get the whole story. There's this whole famine, and they, they show back up in Egypt, all right? The brothers do, and they don't know that Joseph has now become the prince of Egypt, right? He's the second guy in charge. Joseph could squash his brothers like a bug. His brothers wanted to kill him. They were jealous of his relationship with his father. People are always jealous of other relationships. See, it's, it's all throughout Scripture, old and new. And so they wanted to kill Joseph. One brother finally said, well, let's not kill him. Let's just throw him in this cistern. And, and then they take him out, and then they see this slave, these slave drivers coming, and they sell him off to this band of people, and he goes to Egypt, right? Now, several years later, Joseph grows up. He's the, he is the, there's Pharaoh, and then there's Joseph. And Joseph sees his brothers. Joseph has the power and he has the ability to kill them. He could kill them if he wanted and no one would ask any questions. You don't question the second guy in command. The only one who could question is Pharaoh. And Pharaoh put him in charge. Pharaoh was not going to question. He could have sent them back home empty-handed. He could have thrown them in a dungeon like, like Joseph had been. But look at what Joseph's words were in difficult situation. You intended to harm me but God intended it all for good. Do you guys get that? I know that's just, just that, that verse has brought some comfort to me even as late. What, what, what others have intended for harm, God has intended for good. And look at what he says. He's brought me to this position so that I could save the lives of many people. Church, any of us, what, again, young, middle-aged, old, graduating seniors, if we run away from a problem, you know what? You may never be in that position again to help solve that problem. If we run away from, from adversity, we may never be able to fulfill the plan that God had for us. He may have put us there for a reason. And so I say it's time for us to stop giving up when things get difficult. You know, gen young people, graduating seniors, let me just say this to you. You know what? You be the generation. You be the generation that says, I'm committed. You be the generation that says, we're going to end divorce. We're going to stay married. You guys be the generation that does that. And let us learn from you. Amen? Amen. All right. Here's the third thing. Let's move on. Third thing is this. To stay in that lane, have your focus on Jesus, here's what you've got to do. You've got to live a life of integrity. Always live a life of integrity. <clears throat> there was this... Um, uh, book called The Leadership Challenge. And the authors of this book, for over 30 years, had been conducting surveys on leadership. And here's what they did. Uh, they went to over 100,000 employees, people who were who employees, from around the world. And the goal of their survey was to discover what the employees expected of their leaders. All right? So here's the question that they, po they posed, this one simple question to all these employees. Here's the question. What traits would a leader have to possess in order for you to gladly follow them? Now, I want you to think about that. Uh, everyone in this room right now, I want you to think about that. 
Go, do it right now. And you young people, as you're going to go out into the workplace, what, what traits would a leader have to have in order for you to follow them? Right now, everybody get a mental picture in your head. Just name some things. What, immediately, what comes to your mind? Probably it's things like enthusiasm. It's things like encouragement. It's, it's um, it things, I mean, matter of fact, they found 225 different traits around the world that were kind of uh, consistent with them. You had to be a visionary, someone who was a good communicator, someone who's charismatic. Obviously, they, some, some intelligence involved, all right? But what it came down to, what the number one characteristic that they looked for in a leader, the only way they'd be willing to follow, you guys know what the number one one was? honesty. They said the only way we will follow someone is if they are men and women of integrity. Let me tell you what, that's extremely biblical. Um, Look here, look at what this says. Proverbs 2, 7 says, he grants a treasure of common sense to the honest. He is a shield to those who walk with integrity. I I don't know about you, but I, I love that last part of that verse. Do you get that? You know who the he is? The he is God. Guys, listen to that. When you are a man or a woman of integrity, God has literally got your back, or really your front. <laughs> he is walking before you with a shield. He will prote- In other words, what that's saying is when people throw fiery darts at you or they try to accuse you of things that are not true because you have lived a life of integrity, God says, no, 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 I got their back. I'm going to block those because look at their lifestyle. It's consistent with a life of honesty and integrity. Not only does it say that there in Proverbs, but look what the psalmist says. May integrity and honesty protect me, for I put my hope in you. That's what the psalmist says. And the reason that honesty is a key characteristic is because it enables us to trust and to be trusted. Listen, without honesty, without honesty, your word means nothing. And eventually, it will destroy your life and it will destroy all relationships. Guys, don't give in to the pressures of just kind of shading the truth, even a little bit. Just to try to fit it. You know what? Tell the whole story. Tell the whole story. I, have, I don't know. Maybe you, have you ever known someone like this? I don't, you don't have to shout out any names or anything. Or don't, don't be pointing at anybody. You know? But you know what I'm talking about? People that this just pretty much they open their mouth and you know what comes out. It's not truth. You know? And if you think about it, if they have any relationships at all, every one of their relationships are in turmoil. Because nobody can trust a word that they say. Young people, I would challenge you, and all of us in this room, let's be people of integrity. Let's, let's go back to Moses for just a second. Here's an Old Testament example. And the point I'm trying to make is this, is that this is, this is a foundational principle for over 4,000 years. Moses led all these people out of Egypt, right? There's probably over a million of them now, and they're wandering around in the desert for 40 years. And so Moses is the leader of a million people. He's kind of like president or something, right? And all of these people are coming to Moses with their problems. They're coming to Moses, and he is just overwhelmed. Finally, his father-in-law, Jethro, which I just love that name. I should have named one of my kids. That is a cool name. Jethro comes to him and says, hey, basically, what are you doing? You know, you've got all these people. Why in the world are you the one who's leading them? Here's what you, all of them, you have got to delegate. All right? And I'm not trying to make this a message on leadership, but here's what I'm trying to do. Look at what he says. And then it's right here in Exodus 18, 21. Here's what he says. He says this. Jethro says to Moses, but select from all the people some capable, honest men who fear God and hate bribes and appoint them as leaders. You know what I find is interesting here? I mean, he says, here's what you got to do. If you're going to be a leader, if you're going to be a person of influence, if you're going to guide others, then here's what has to happen. Yes, they have to be people who are capable. They've got to have some ability there, right? Some leadership ability. They've got to be people who who, who, who fear God. They've got to be people who won't take bribes. But the thing that stands out the most to me is that they are people of integrity. Jethro says, don't get somebody that you can't trust. I don't know about you, but I want that said of me. I want to have a legacy that says, if nothing else, you could trust the guy. He was a man or she was a woman of integrity. And I think what's interesting is that this research that this company, that these guys did in this book, is, it, it showed that 4,000 years later, it's as equally important for people to have trust as it was 
for Moses 4,000 years ago. People, listen to me. Leaders that, that people want to follow have got to be honest. So, young people, adults, all of us, if we want people to follow us, if we want people to respect us, if we want people to hold us in high regards, then we have got to be honest in everything we do. Are you with me? Every dealing, every relationship, everything. Everything. All right. Be men and women of integrity. Here's the last thing I just want to say to you. All right. And uh, I'm just going to wrap up with this. All those other things are awesome. And I hope that I mean, you can't be a follower of Jesus and not live those three things. But here's the fourth and most important thing. Above all else, and I think you probably can figure it out, always put God, what? First. Always. Above all else in your life, the only way to stay on target, the only way to hit the target and not veer to the other lane is if God is first and foremost in every respect of your life. And I'm not talking about compartmentalizing your lives and saying, well, God, I'm going to put you first on Sunday mornings in a youth group or when I go to Bible study, but God, I want you to be first in absolutely everything. Jesus said these words right here. Many of you know this verse, have it memorized in some form, but it's Matthew 6, 33 and 34. I'm going to put both of them in there. Jesus says, look, seek the kingdom of God above all things and live righteously. So seek God first, and then you live a righteous lifestyle. And when you do that, you, young people, man, because it took me years. I'm just stupid. I'll just be honest with you. I'm not very smart. But it took me years to grasp this. So if you young people can be smarter than me right now, get this. Trust God. Y'all listen to me. Trust God. Listen to God. Live for God. He will meet all of your needs. I cannot tell you how many things I have struggled in, financially, spiritually, relationally, because I, God was not first. I did it my way. Kind of a little Frank Sinatra for us older folks, right? I did They're going, who? Anyway, I did it my way. But here's what's awesome. Jesus finishes up this verse or, or continues with this thought. Look what he says here. Because when that happens, he says, you don't have to worry about tomorrow. Right? Uh, tomorrow is going to have its own issues anyway, its own worries, and, and today's troubles are hard enough. But let me just tell you what, whether it's tomorrow or the next day or 10 years from now, if you will put me first and you'll live a life of righteousness, you're never going to have to worry about anything. Is that not an awesome thought? I don't know about you, but I don't want to worry. <laughs> I know that's part of our human nature, and we do, but we don't have to. All of these other character traits that I just mentioned, live for others, um, you know, don't, don't give up when things get tough, and, um, and what was my third one? Come on, what was my third one? It's a test, because I can't even remember it. Yeah, live a life of integrity, thank you. See, I was being honest with you, I forgot what I said. <laughs> All those things mean nothing if Jesus Christ is not first and foremost in your life. There's a, there's a relationship, or, or there, excuse me, there's an exercise that's often done. Um, it just, it, it, it says this. It, it, it goes, it's, it has to do with leadership, if you want to be a good leader, but I think this is a great exercise for every one of us to do. It says this, it says, imagine that um, you're attending your own funeral, Right? What are the things that you want to hear said about you as you're laying in the casket? Whatever those things are that you want to be said about you, begin practicing them right now. And my prayer is this. For every single one of us in this room, whether we're just beginning a new phase of life or whether we're, we're well up in our years, my prayer is this. That one day when you're in a place such as this, or in a chapel, or wherever it is, or wherever it is, and there's a casket there, or there's someone who's eulogizing or, or honoring you, they can say, man, let me tell you about this person. Let me tell you about Kara, and Abby, and Alyssa, and Joshua, and James. Let me tell you, they were, I mean, there is nothing that they wouldn't do for somebody else. They, they lived lives of integrity. And when things got tough, man, those guys were resilient. They didn't quit. And people rave about that, and they, they talk about that. I mean, that's, that's just kind of whispered around, you know, when they're out in the wake gathering, and they're talking about, this is what's said. 
They're, they're not mourning. They're celebrating the kind of person you were. But the greatest thing that we'll hear in those whispers are people who say, yeah, but you know what I love most about them? Is that they loved Jesus. And man, I saw many times where the lanes all around them were, were just pulling them and, and, and enticing them and tempting them, but they stayed focused to serve Jesus. And as they are laying in this casket, that's what we celebrate the most. That's my prayer for each and every one of us. I, I've told this story before, but, uh, so forgive me if, if you've heard it, but um, I think it's appropriate and you may want to hear it again. When I was a youth pastor in Ohio, um, it was it a was small town, very small town, like literally one traffic light in the town. There wasn't a whole lot of schools. Um, I've said it before, it's, it's the joke's old, but um, it's, it, it's called, uh, we had nothing but cornfields, as far as the eye can see. So we, we joked, seriously, we wanted to name our ministry Children of the Corn Ministries, because uh, it's just, anyway. Um, but there was this man named Mark, this young boy named Marcus. He was 17 years old. He was a senior in high school, and Mark was, was about to graduate, just a few months away from it. And spring had hit. Of course, when you're in Ohio, deep, deep into Ohio, it's just miserable winters, and you can't wait for spring to hit. And so it was, it was getting later in the year, and um, they were going, uh, a bunch of kids were going to the lake that weekend. And Marcus was out on the lake with all his buddies. He was on a jet ski. And as he was on the jet ski, there was a tragic accident, and Marcus was killed. Now, because we're such a small town, everybody obviously knew this, and everybody is seems some way related somehow to somebody, and it wrecked the town. And so uh, it was on a weekend, and the school called me uh, as, as one of the youth pastors in that area and said, hey, would you be willing to come in on Monday for just kind of do some grief counseling because we know it's going to be a tough day? And I, and I said, absolutely. You know, I, I mean, first and foremost, priority. And, and so I got there on Monday. And as I got there on Monday and I sat down, and they kind of, for whatever reason, uh, they, had, they had different groups of people, but I got the group that was the closest in friendships to Marcus, the guys that kind of hung with him the most. Um, and so I sat down with them, and I just I kind of just I talked with them and just, you know, loved on them. And I finally said, let's, let's do something. Let's do this. I said, you guys just tell me. Let, let's just let's talk about the great things about Marcus. What stands out about Marcus? What, what is it that you, what did he love? And for the longest time, there was just silence. And finally, one kid just kind of piped up and said, well, he loved, he loved cars, and he loved fast cars. He loved to drive fast. I'm like, okay, well, cool. I mean, yeah, most teenage boys do. That's awesome. Uh, I know that I, I certainly love to drive fast cars and actually still do to this day. You've got to be careful with that. That's cool. So something else. Somebody just give me something about Marcus. A few more minutes of silence, and finally somebody popped up and said, <laughs> jokingly, they kind of laughed and said, well, I know he loved girls. Man, he loved to chase girls. I said, okay, so Marcus loves fast cars and fast women. I got it. What else? What else does Marcus love? And it was total silence. This group of teenagers, all they could come up with for Marcus, who was now laying on a slab, was that he liked to drive fast cars and he liked to chase girls. That was the legacy that Marcus had left behind. And it was difficult, but I used that as a teaching moment with those young people. And I leave it to you this morning as a teaching moment for all of us. I don't know about you, but that's not what I want said of me as I'm laying in that casket. Right? I want it said of each of you and of myself. Here lays a person who above all things lived their life for Jesus. They stayed on target. They never veered. They aimed and they hit what they were aiming for. You know, he was a man or a woman of integrity. He was a man or a woman who stuck with it. He was a man or a woman who lived for Jesus. That's what I want it said of you and me. Young people, listen to me this morning. You have your whole lives ahead of you. You do. And some of you are about to make the decision to go to college. 
Some of you are about to make the decision to, to enter into a career field. Some of you, in a matter of years, you'll be starting families. I, I pray that as you do this, and I pray for each and every one of us in this room, no matter what stage of life we're in, that we're on target. I don't want it to be said that you were an expert in this area, but you aimed at the wrong thing. So I say to you this morning, what is it? Is there something right now? Stephen, why don't you come on up, buddy? Is there something right now that's, that's keeping you you know the target. The target is Christ. It's, being, it's living a Christ-centered life. But this, over in lane 1, and lane 2, and lanes 5, and 6, and 10, and 12, it's pulling me in, man. It's, it's competing for my attention, and I'm giving in to it. Is there something this morning that you, that you know would keep you, would keep it uh, uh, the being said of you of those things, those characteristics as followers of Jesus? My prayer is that young people, adults, all of us, we're staying on target. Amen? Let me ask you to bow your heads and close your eyes. We're going to sing. And as we sing, I want you to think. I want to think. What do I need to change? What do I need to let go of? Of these four things that were mentioned this morning, what do I need to work on the most? Maybe it's number four. Maybe I just have, I'm putting other things before my Savior. And therefore, none of the other stuff in my life is making sense. I want to challenge you to stay on target. And if there's something that's pulling your eye off of the target, put it back on Jesus. Maybe you need to come to the altar this morning just to confess. Just, just to fall out before God and say, I've blown it. I've been hitting the wrong target. I want to get back focused on you, Jesus. Maybe that's your prayer this morning. Young people, maybe you just want to pray for the direction of your lives. Now that, that you've graduated high school, this momentous occasion, God, what do you have for me next? What is your dream and your plan for my life? And commit to follow him. Jesus, help us with that. Forgive us, God, when we have gone off target, when we have shot the wrong thing, but we, we hit it because we were aiming for it. Help us, God, to be men and women of integrity. Help us, God, to be men and women who are resilient. Help us, God, to be men and women who live for others, but ultimately who put you first. It's in Christ's name we pray. Amen. You guys do some business with God for just a few minutes.